We're partnering with the Idea Festival and IF University for this panel, um, which Chris Himmel right here, he leads the, uh, the IF Festival, or IF University and the Idea Festival. So thank you so much. Chris is going to be moderating for us today. Um, I also want to give a, a very special welcome to our friends online. Um, if you um, uh, pull this up anywhere in the world and watch us this after afternoon, um, if they have questions or comments, they can certainly um, use a hashtag Humanifest uh, through Twitter and post that there, and we will do our best to incorporate that into the conversation. And of course, all of us um, can continue this discussion afterwards um, online, and certainly you can access that conversation through actorstheater.org. I believe we are ready to go, so Chris. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming out on a Sunday, a beautiful Sunday at noon. Um, you're uh, dedicated. Hopefully, all the discussion up here and with you will uh, uh, will make that have made a good choice. Again, again, thank you. My name is Chris Kimmel. Um, I'm the founder of the Idea Festival, uh, as well as president of the Kentucky Science Technology Corporation, which is the parent company over over the Idea Festival. Um, I actually did one of these sessions last week, and I think this one will be um, equally, if not more interesting. It's, it's a really interesting topic, and we have some really interesting people here um, to, to delve into this. Um, IF University, just very quickly, is a new development, a new product, in a sense, of the um, Idea Festival, which we'll be rolling out within the next, probably about the next six weeks, and it really is our attempt to take what the festival is about and roll that out on a regular basis in the city. Uh, we're launching it actually both in Louisville and Lexington, and uh, as you'll see, um, when we normally uh, uh, roll out the program, what we're going to be offering is a whole series of regular, small, discussion-centered uh, conversations around different topics and classes, as well as events. And so um, you'll be seeing that. Uh, we just, uh, Dana Cox uh, has been uh, brought on, who's the Chief Creative Officer for IF University, and what we hope is really create on an ongoing basis more opportunities like this. Um, in, and in some many cases, much, much smaller groups to continue um, to pursue and talk about different kinds of, of ideas in all, all different fields. So uh, you'll be hearing about, more about that uh, in the near future. Um, today, we're going to be talking about um, the role of, of the artist uh, in, in change um, and in creativity and the whole issue of creativity and creative thinking and the, um, how that kind of comes about and the role that it plays in our, in our society today, whether it be business or science or the arts or education. Uh, or whatever. Uh, generally, what we what we do, or the way I like to do these, is nobody's going to open up with remarks. Or we don't want it to be that formal. Um, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to just briefly um, introduce themselves, and I'm going to throw a question out. The, the first 15 or 20 minutes, we'll pretty much <coughs> pursue a line of, of, uh, of discussion, and then very quickly, I'll stop and, and invite the, the audience to <coughs> take part in this discussion. So you can ask questions, you can make comments. Um, um, you're not limited to anything, but we want you to be a part a part of, of uh, the discussion. So having said that, let me ask each person just to very quickly introduce themselves, tell a little bit about their self, about themselves. Uh, my name's Rick Johnson. I work... Mike, use the mic, because they're, they're recording us, so. Okay. Is it on? It's on. Hello. My name's Rick Johnson. I work for Kentucky Science and Technology Corporation. Um, I'm working with small and medium-sized manufacturers around the state of Kentucky to help them grow. I'm Lisa Crone, and uh, I'm a playwright and an actor, and um, I live in New York, but I'm actually here in Louisville right now at the Humana Festival doing uh, my play, The Verizon Play. Hi, I'm Jay Rimley, and I'm an artist, and my work exists somewhere between art, design, science, and cultural critique. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, having said that, um, we talk about the issue of the role of the artist, uh, creativity, etc., and how uh, what the artist brings to a particular situation. Um, I'd like to start out by asking: Is in fact we talk about design thinking, we talk about science thinking, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do do in fact um, do artists think differently? Is it they actually think differently, or they view the world differently, or what is that unique unique perspective um, that an artist can bring to a, any given situation? <laughs> um, I guess I can I can only 
me just speak for myself in that I, my process is, is one of, of, of an intense kind of immersion process and I call it a transdisciplinary research-based process in which I um, take a given um, social situation or social problem and I immerse myself in that um, and then learn as much as I can and then um, go through a sort of an ideation process where I'm, I'm sort of doing research and learning more about the issue and then coming up with various prototypes. I talk just a, just a second, maybe tell them what you're working on right now, your, your, your big project. Sure. So the project I'm working on right now is called the Infinity Burial Project. And I'm developing an alternative burial system where I'm promoting the idea of uh, decomposition in our culture as opposed to our current practices of preservation um, in dealing with bodies. And so part of that is I'm training edible mushrooms to become body decomposers and toxin remediators. So I'm building burial suits that have mushroom spores embedded in them and um, decompiculture kits. And I have a society called the Decompiculture Society, where members are called decomponauts, um, <laughs> <laughs> who seek death acceptance and are um, interested in, in developing this mushroom. Wait, wait, start off your <laughs> Uh, what theater makers and playwrights are interested in is, um, uh, I think, the, the way that theater people, theater creators in the world, is that, you know, we walk, all of us are walking through the same world. We might encounter different things, but, you know, there are a zillion, billion things we come into, count, uh, come into contact with, and everyone sort of makes their own, has their own sort of valence of what they take in about that, the narratives they create about that. And I think what theater makers do is to choose a different set of things, a particular set of things. That's what gives, when you say a playwright has a voice, it's because you start to see the world from that perspective. I mean, a good writer who, uh, uh, I think, uh, you can all have a sense of how that works, is David Sedaris, right? It's, it, it's strange and familiar at the same time. Um, the way he walks through the world, what he sees. And I think that's uh, certainly what theater artists do, and I think uh, um, other kinds of artists, um, novelists, poets, um, painters, I suppose, um, you know, you, you pull out um, things that are in the world levels of experience. Um, you're interested in, notice, in noticing, in noticing things and highlighting things valences of experience that perhaps aren't evident. And that's how we respond to art, right? We're like, that. I never saw it in that way, and yet I see that that is there, that that is true. Rick, I know a lot of the work you do is, you talk about many, but it's a lot of design-centered innovation, which brings in a lot of issues of design and art. So how does that kind of go into what you're doing? Well, the technical people, um, they're taught processes and they want to follow those processes and you really can't do anything meaningful that way. You need to um, understand your customer, um, get inside your customer's head, and you need to create something that, that, that's really going to create a meaningful experience for them. So, so the, the design process really isn't so orderly, it's much messier and so if you sort of collide the two worlds, um, the, the final product, while, while the process may trouble a lot of the technical people, the final product is, is always very much better. I want to go back to what you talked about, C. I, I remember Picasso, I think, once said, I don't, I don't, um, 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 I don't search, I find. Um, and this question of seeing and how we see the world, I mean, certainly I think people do train themselves to see the world differently. Business people see it differently, artists, scientists, um, et cetera. Um, it's kind of what you're looking at, um, and um, I've often felt too that I mean I would think you, we can that that is a trait that we can actually train ourselves to do. It's not just innate. I mean I think we can we can train ourselves to have our radar up all the time. And I'd like to talk about how do that that issue of first of all I want to ask you know how does the, in your view do do science, you know artists um, um, you know see the world and is there something innate after that or is it really just a process that maybe one of the big differences among various groups is not so much how we go from there but literally just how we see the world how we've constructed our, ourselves to, to observe things um i mean certainly that's what a, a writing teacher 
does, that's one thing a writing teacher does, I suppose, is to uh, teach people techniques to do that. Some people are more interested in it than others. Um, yeah, I get, uh, we were talking about this before, about how your brain's hardwired, what it's interested, what it, you know, wh whether everyone is capable of the same things everybody else is capable of if you just understand the wiring, I don't know. People are interested in different things. I mean, my brain won't, there are a lot of, you know, I have a, I have the intention to be really interested in science. My brain won't really hold certain kinds of specificity very well. I don't know if I could be trained to do that or not. Perhaps you all could help me out. <laughs> I think one of the things, I mean, one of the many skills that I think contemporary artists, particularly conceptual artists have, is this kind of um, being able to see the opportunities for disruption in any given situation. Um, just to give you an example, I worked in New Orleans um, with the city's recovery, hurricane recovery office. And while I was there, there were, you know, there were thousands of FEMA trailers that were sitting in lots, right, that the government was paying uh, millions of dollars for, for rental spaces and all that. And I saw that kind of as an opportunity to, to think about the, these trailers in the context of environmental history and the injustices that were, um, that existed in the Gulf Coast and the region. So that was, I mean, that's one example. Um, also, uh, when we talk about, you know, we talk about artists seeing the world differently, the role, role of art in, in kind of problem solving. Um, uh, I always tell the story because I think it's an interesting story. Back uh, during um, uh, several, uh, 150 years ago or whatever, it, we were um, struggling. A lot of the scientists today were struggling um, with, they couldn't figure out why the sky was, was light. Um, why it wasn't dark, and it's called Olber's paradox, and they couldn't they couldn't figure out as to why, um, with so many stars in the in the sky, why in fact the star the light wasn't wasn't um, evident at, at nighttime, and they struggled with this for years and years and years, and the person who actually um, first wrote correctly and, and actually um, uh, uncovered the reason for that was Edgar Allan Poe in a poem. Um, so I think it gets up back to the point where you're talking about disruption. Um, you know, people bringing different perspectives to um, uh, to a problem. I know um, uh, Leonard Schlein, who spoke at the Idea Festival a couple times and unfortunately passed away a couple years ago, wrote a book, great book called Art and Physics, um, about one of the things he talked about in that book was how many um, ideas, sometimes very complex ideas, were actually first envisioned by artists far before scientists actually kept up, like, you know, just light bend and things like that. So what is it, I mean, what is it in this disruptive, what is it about someone who is uh, inclined in that way that, that sees the world differently? Let me think about it a little bit. <laughs> in, in engineering, they teach people rules, and they say, here are the rules, and, and I think, what you need are people that don't aren't beholden to the rules. Um, uh, you go back to the mouse. The mouse was invented by the Palo Alto, the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. Nobody did anything with it. The standard keyboard had however many switches on it. Key is 115. And how could you do all that with with one button? You know. And so it took somebody that that was bounded by by the rules they were taught. Now we've even lost that one button. So, uh, so back to the basis of kind of all this is based on a platform of creativity. I mean, is, can we te can you teach creativity? Is this something you teach, or is it just you just you just you're just either born with it or you're not? Like anything else, some people are better than others. But I think you put the groups together. I mean, I'm very interested in this idea of of looking for areas of disruption. I mean, I think that's right. I I don't I have no idea whether these things are innate or, um, or can be taught. I, I don't really know the answers to those questions. Um, but I do, I, I mean, I think that's exactly key, that there is a fascination, a, a, an interest in going into an unknown place, going into a, a fissure. You know, that, that feeling that there's something, and, and being interested in dynamism, being interested in change, being interested in, in uncertainty, in, in going toward the, the place where there's going toward a gray area. I mean, I think that is the difference between people who are, I suppose, inventing something new or interested, certainly creatively, but I think also scientifically, and people who are not. Do you go toward certainty or do you go toward that which is 
um, that, that which doesn't add up. Well, let's stop and open it up now and join, invite you to join us. I'd like you to follow up on this question about, you know, can, it, can creativity be taught? I don't mean just to kids. I mean, can it be, is it something that actually can be passed on or at least some of the traits? Yes, sir. I think that you need a definition of creativity as opposed to originality. Because creativity is synonymous in many areas with just problem solving. And it's getting, you know, come out of education, it's getting a, a lot of use uh, in a lot of areas. But for me, that's different than originality, and, and I'm not sure what you all are talking about. So when you say creativity, and can it be yeah, When I say creativity, I use it very in a broad sense. You know, the, in a sense, I, I embrace things like innovation, imagination, curiosity, um, the ability to see things differently. I think it also, in my mind, when I see creativity, I also tend to think of it, the applied piece of it too, that it's you know, someone who, in my mind, is, is creative, is someone who can also take those traits and actually apply them in some constructive way. I take that creativity, whether it happens to be in science, in business, uh, dance, theater, I actually don't differentiate. I think that one of the mistakes we make uh, is that we somehow have, you know, think creativity is limited to artists or something, and in fact, I think some of the most creative people I've ever encountered were scientists um, uh, who thought differently. And actually, many of them, um, to Lisa's point, weren't bound by the certainty. We're actually willing uh, to deal with a lot of ambiguity and, and uncertainty and unknown um, type things. So I, I look at it very broadly defined. Yes, yes. Um, I wonder if you could ask the panelists to talk about, like, maybe you can't teach creativity, but you can certainly teach people to be more collaborative, and you've got a room of theater artists who are becoming better collaborators, I hope. So if you need to talk about, because sometimes there's ground rules help collaboration. And Everybody get that question issue. Maybe creativity can't be taught, maybe, but certainly things like collaboration uh, can be. This is a sort of a small point, but I, um, I mean, I've worked collaboratively. Um, I mean, anyone who works in theater works collaboratively. I also uh, worked with a collaborative theater company for many years called Five Lesbian Brothers, and uh, we wrote plays together. And um, uh, so I have a lot of experience with this, but I, I feel like there's something important in the, to me, there's a, a key for me, a key in becoming a writer, for instance, because I was a performer before I became a writer, was the moment when I realized that this uncomfortable feeling I had when I was writing was never going to go away. That that discomfort was actually what it feels like to make something that hasn't been made before. And I do tell this to my students all the time, that you, you, the, you know, we talk a lot about, um, in our culture, we talk a lot about risk. And I think that there is a way in the sort of Oprahization of our culture, and don't get me wrong, I love Oprah, but there's, a, but there's a, a way that we have taken that to mean that you take a risk because that'll feel a little funny, but then it's all going to work out. But the thing about risk is that you don't know whether it's going to work out or not. If you actually know the end point, then there is no risk. And any sustained endeavor I think scientifically, certainly artistically, you can be assured there will be humiliating, crushing failure at some point. <laughs> you can be assured of that. That's part of the gig. If you look at any great artist and look at their career, the arc of their career, you will be certain to find humiliating, crushing failure, a period of that, because you can't make something new. If, if you knew what it was going to be, then it would already exist. And I think that's I, I don't know, you know, some people have a tolerance for that and other people don't. I think creative people, particularly who are creative over time, who lead these lives over time, they have a tolerance for the possibility, in fact the inevitability, that they will fail. So no, I that's think you're exactly right. I remember hearing some, uh, a scientist one time who was congratulated on, on a discovery and, you know, said, you know, boy, this is really great, you know, what a genius. He said, you know, he said, you know, I failed 146 times, it was only on the 147th that I got it right. Uh, and I think, yeah, it's an interesting point, and I do think, a lot of times we call it, one of the number one characteristic of, of, I've seen more of successful people, I think, in any field, uh, tends to be persistence. And whether it's persistence, but I think part of that is you're right, you, you have to have a high tolerance um, for failure and for things not going your way. Um, Guy Kawasaki, who started Apple and Garage.com, I heard him speak a couple of years ago, and he actually said something that has helped me a lot um, through my career, and he said, you know, I'm paraphrasing, he said, don't worry about when people don't jump at your ideas. 
If it's a really good idea, you have to shove it down their throats. Uh, and, and I think you have to have that confidence in what you're doing. Yeah, and you have to live with the periods where you don't have confidence. You have to live with periods of time where you not only not know if you're going to be right or wrong, but if it's worth anything. You know, if, if it was all, you know, that's, that's actually what it's like. And I think we look at narratives like somebody like Steve Jobs and we talk about all the time, you know, or, you know, any number of people and we say they struggled here and here and here. But we picture that they always felt like the successful person at the end. And maybe some of them did, but that's not what it feels like to be in process. And I think that's the important thing to realize is that that horrible, sick feeling that you are alone, you're crazy, you're wrong, and you're going to fail. This is what it feels like. That's not a mistake. And I think you have to that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about technology and imagination. Uh, I think today we can literally have anything we need entertainment wise, news, literature, at the touch of a button instantaneously. And I'm kind of wondering now if that leaves any room for the human imagination anymore, if we constantly need to be stimulated. And I was wondering if you think that they can go hand in hand, or if we should focus a little more about letting our minds wander again. Question about the role of technology and tech, you know, and creativity and the fact that we can basically everything we want, entertainment-wise or even knowledge-wise, is at, a, at our fingertips now. I just heard a great talk about introversion and the power of introverts, mm -hmm. and I think that that you know a lot of I, I'm all obviously I'll, I'm all for collaboration, but I think a lot of good ideas also get killed in a group process, and I think it's uh, really critical for creativity and a lot of other processes to to, to, to be quiet and to and to be alone. And Steve Wozniak, one of the co-founders of Apple, says you know one of the best things you can do is to 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 just be alone and um, to think a little bit. I, I couldn't agree more. I think sort of unplugging, um, doing whatever it is you enjoy doing, and I, you know, I have the things I do, and they're far away from technology. The interesting thing is, through observation, um, you, you actually can learn a lot. There, you, you can learn an awful lot. I think there's also an issue, there's the big difference between knowing and understanding. Um, and we can know a lot by flipping things and doing our, you know, we can know that's not the same as understanding the context. But I think your question about technology is a really interesting one. We were talking in the green room beforehand uh, about the role of disruption and change. Uh, and um, Lisa was, I thought, brought up a really interesting qu a point about that maybe, you know, it's not that things don't work um, currently or now. Um, they work, maybe they worked at a time, but times have changed, and so now it's time to go on and evolve to something else. And I think one of the big, I think, issues uh, for all of us is that one of the things that technology has brought about, at least in my observation, is that people are no longer comfortable, in many respects, being passive recipients of information. You know, people sit home and watch TV and text with other people, and you know, they, th this whole issue of what technology, Facebook, and this collaboration, and etc. And I would ask to pose the question: So, you know, what uh, maybe in the terms that we're talking a lot about, because I know there's a lot of theater people here, what comes after the theater as we understand it? I mean, factoring in that that issue of technology is it's not that that's wrong. Is there is there do we you know do we just say well we're just going to continue doing it like we've always done it, and because or is there some some, some way that you begin to involve that technology, embrace it, um, not to destroy the form, but in to expand it. Uh, well, you know, theater has been advertised as dying for hundreds, if not thousands of years. <laughs> um, I mean, I, you know, my sort of theory of the core of essence of theater is that theater does, it's the art form that does something that no other art form does. The operating principle of theater is that it um, recapitulates that which is the, mo the truest, most universal thing about human experience, which is that nobody, no matter who they are, no matter how well situated, how connected, how advantaged, how lucky, has any uh, knowledge or control over the coming moment. That is the essence of being alive. We project narratives forwards and backwards, but in fact, all of us are innocent of the coming moment. That is what theater is made of. It's made of watching characters on stage who don't know what's going to happen to them. And that, when we feel that truth about life, 
That's when we feel that we are alive, right? That's why we feel that incandescence at a deathbed, at a birth, uh, after a tragedy, um, in a war zone, because we feel all of a sudden what is true, which is that despite our fondest wishes and our best laid plans, we have no control over what's going to happen next. Um, and it is uh, completely, you know, it's sort of the most humanizing thing we can experience. Theater happens in a room with, and, and theater is different from storytelling that way, right? So, and it's something that happens in plays sort of, it happens a lot because we think a story is dramatic action, but a story is about something that's already happened. What happens in the theater is that a person is telling you a story. That story is either going to go the way they thought it was going to go, or it's not. Right? That's, I think that's a very important distinction to make. And theater is happening right now in this room with these people. And we also feel that other valence of the theatrical experience. It, we can see the actors doing it. That's why, for some of us, our most vivid moment in the theater is when something went wrong, right? A <laughs> set fell or something, or somebody forgot their line or something, and then we're really, we're, you know, it's galvanizing and it's electric. Um, that's never going to stop being amazing to people. People are never going to stop craving that. And it can't happen in any other way than it happens in the theater. It's very hard to do it well. But doing it well is so amazing that those of us who go to the theater will keep going to a lot of bad theater in search of that moment where we see that amazing, alive thing happen, right? It's so incredible. And that's why it's still, you know, that's why this thousands of year old art form is still being practiced and why I think it won't go away. That being said, there are of course all kinds of technical uh, things that happen in a theater that didn't used to happen. Um, all kinds of ways to create beautiful scenic effects and now we can also, um, you know, we can video theater and we can look at it in different ways, but we all know that watching a video, even beautifully filmed video of theater, isn't the same as being in the room. Um, so, yes, it has, it certainly ch can change um, many things that we can do in the theater. There's much more sort of video and all kinds of different scenic things that happen in the theater, but the essence of what happens in the theater, I actually think people are, they will always be drawn to that. And in a certain way, I mean, I feel like, you know, many of the ancient cultures of theater have uh, gone away. I mean, Louisville, uh, this theater is kind of an exception with its apprentice program. That's a very old-fashioned way to learn about theater. But, um, I actually think uh, there are, there's a lot of really great theater being made in this country right now. And I think technology, the search for human connection through that is, is I and mean, technology will become more humanized. And I think the intersection of people who are living in the world of, uh, you know, Facebook and their iPhones and whatever, and also doing theater, is going to humanize those technologies, I think. Let me give another view, though, of, of theater and, and the story and creating the story. The businesses I work with, none of them are good at all at creating that story and telling that story. And um, they, they could learn a lot from theater. Question, comment, yes. Um, a lot of the online conversation right now tends to be around the um, collaboration and then the, uh, literally, I mean on our panel. Um, and uh, one of the questions that was submitted about collaboration and teaching was, could it be argued that you can teach creativity? If so, are there any thoughts on how? I would hear that question. The question is, can you in fact create, create, teach creativity? And, and the question is how? So anyone want to respond? Yes, yes sir. Um, I, I teach acting phenomenon majors at the University of Louisville, and a lot of uh, the, be the beginning of my work has to do with giving people the permission to imagine because they're taught, these, most of my students are non-traditional and far older and have come back to college. So they're taught that imagination is for children and that's kid stuff. So a lot of the work is sort of unlearning, a lot of undoing, a lot of um, Robert Cohen and Kristen Linklater playing and being free to imagine. So uh, I, th I think it can be <coughs> cultivated and, and fostered um, because uh, we have to learn as a society that you know, imagination is a good thing. That's an interesting point because so much in our culture, a lot of these traits we talk about, curiosity, uh, imagination, uh, are, are in fact attributes that are attributed primarily to children. Um, and that's like, you know, you, you need to grow out of that kind of stuff. I mean, that's an interesting, interesting point. Yes, yes, sir, back. Well, I think that uh, creativity is innate 
in, um, in, in all human beings. We see it in children. Like every child knows how to draw. Every child knows how to sing. Every child knows how to tell a story and imagine a scenario and, and you know, move the firemen around the city or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I think that um, what gets crushed out of people is their desire to expose themselves to the risk that making an innovative jump poses to them. And so I think that what you do in order to discover and fuel innovation is to create an environment where risks are encouraged, where people's failures, which are inevitable with risk, um, are backed up, and we, we figure out how to deal with failure very quickly, and figure out what ideas don't work quickly and adjust course. But I think that if you create a working environment, either in business, or in technology, or in the arts, where risk and failure are understood to be part of the process and to be celebrated, then you get a more innovative workforce and a more innovative group of people working together to find new solutions to new problems, which is what you're looking for. You're always trying to do more with less. The person who, um, a, a person who's doing incredible work in terms of helping people reclaim their childlike uh, creative tools is Linda Berry. The cartoonist, maybe some of you know, and she's written in the past couple of years two incredible sort of workbooks that are really delightful. And if anybody's interested in looking at this kind of thing, she, she's the She's the queen of it. She's really amazing. I, I think those comments were great. Um, in engineering, they teach you that a system can't be stable without negative feedback. And I'll point that out to all the companies I work with, that negative feedback or failure is really the quickest way to, to get to a great success. The, the second trick that I try on people is asking them, not related to work, what's something they've done that's very, very memorable in their life. And, and whatever they describe me, it all has the same traits. They didn't think they could do it. They had to learn something new. There was a high risk of failure, um, and it took a lot of hard work. When they got there, um, they had this incredible sense of accomplishment. They're going to remember it for life. So then I go back to them, well, why don't we do that some more then? <laughs> Jay, do you have anything you want to chime in here? I think maybe just from my experience in working um, in academic art departments is that maybe the greater challenge for me, I found, was is helping students to refine their ideas. Like the creativity is already there, but it's a matter of refining the ideas and then learning how to execute them, which I think is the greater challenge. Um, because the ideas are always there. Um, it's a matter of picking the best ones and then distilling it and then finding the best way to execute it. I've always found, I mean, my, my view is that, first of all, I do believe that creativity and innovation can be taught. Um, that doesn't mean that everybody's going to read, you know, learn it or adapt it at the same level. I use the analogy of music. Um, you know, I, somebody can, I, I can be taught how to play piano. I may not be great at it, and maybe all I can play is chopsticks for whatever reason, but it's not that I can't learn how to play piano. Some people will go beyond, some people will be great, some people are, you know, for whatever reason seem to be born to play the piano, etc. But I, at some level, can be taught to play the piano. Um, from there, it gets into how, how much do I want to work at it, what are the traits, et cetera, et cetera. And to me, creativity is very similar to that. People can be taught the attributes, the traits, the tools that enable us to think creatively, to innovate, to be curious, et cetera. Doesn't mean that we're all going to do it at the same level, uh, nor, nor should we. Uh, and I think that one of the biggest misnomers is, number one, is that somehow you're either born that way or you're not. Uh, and secondly, that creativity is somehow the domain of the arts. Uh, and, and if you want to have creativity, and I, I remember I, I was talking to somebody recently in one of the business schools uh, in Kentucky, and, and they were saying, oh, we're really excited and you created this new, this new thrust on creative problem solving. And I said, well, how are you doing it? Well, we're getting somebody from the art department to join our group. And that was their answer, is like, go get somebody from the art department, and now we're going to be creative. Uh, in, in that, I think that one of the biggest mistakes we make, and certainly one of the things the Idea Festival really attempts to, to deal with, is that there is no such thing as useless knowledge. And in fact, all these things are part of one, part of the same whole. And um, you know, that's one of the things we have to we have to learn uh, in that regard. So I think, in my view, it, it can be taught. Where are you? Yes, ma'am. Um, I guess I feel like, from what you're saying, though, is that it, as far as education goes, as a young person. If you're not exposed to the arts, it really trains you to fail re readily and encourages no solution. So if you never have a background in the arts, it would be very hard 
to get in the habit of failure if you haven't done it as a child. Well, I agree. Yeah. You know, I agree. And I think, I think, you know, that's the notion that all, there's nothing such, such thing as useful knowledge. I mean, personally, you know, if you're going to drop the arts, to me, why don't you just drop science, too? I mean, I, you know, to me, they're one and the same. Yes, sir. I think one of the troublesome issues is the, what I would call the pressure of the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me that both in the sciences and in the arts, um, the pressure of the marketplace is always for certainty and success rather than uncertainty and the risk and the possibility and the potential of failure and the creativity that grows out of that. So there is this conflict between, you know, especially in a capitalist society, to have a commercially successful product at the end of whatever the process is and that that can be the crushing element that, uh, that finally um, makes creativity and the commitment to uncertainty really difficult. I couldn't agree more. Yes, yes ma'am. Well, just, just to say the <coughs> overarching comment reaction, I feel like sort of what Lisa was saying, isn't that the struggle of life, though? Like, the, the uncertainty is not just the struggle of the creative process. It's not just the struggle of being an artist or being a scientist, not knowing how the experiment is going to turn out. It's the, it's the struggle of, as a human being, not knowing. And also, I mean, okay, you have a project, it's su successful, but it may not be to someone else, you know? So I, I just feel like if it's the ideology behind the pro, it's, it's a life ideology that we're talking about, not just a creative process ideology. I would argue, yeah, and I, I think just to follow up really quickly, I think you're, I think you're right, and I do think that the one of the big challenges in the fact is it's a reality in our society today, at least in this country, is that things are commercially driven. It's not that um, it's not worthwhile <coughs> taking risk and being creative, but the fact is if you can't get paid for it, um, you know, nobody wants to nobody wants to, to back it. And we just live in we right now we live in a very even you know whether it's artists or even researchers um, uh, you know cannot basically pursue their work. Uh, because no one's willing to fund it if they can't see a dollar sign at the end. Yes, sir. Sometimes I think it can be hard to be creative even in an academic environment. Oh, that's some of the worst. When we're <laughs> when I teach playwriting, and have I taught people to be creative? I don't think so. I think, um, I think I've taught classes in which people have become more creative, and if anything, we just try to trick it out of them. But it's <laughs> already there to be unfolded. But I'm always so hesitant to grade because, if anything, that I'm trying to leave them their fear of failing at the door in a, in a really active way. But just doing it in a the classroom, they bring a sense of, am I succeeding or am I not succeeding, to, you know, to their presence in the room. Russell? Uh, I'm really interested in, in how uh, there's a recurring motif throughout the room uh, both in the audience and on stage with the panelists, uh, this idea of, I, I, I'd like to kind of boil it down to uh, this idea of suffering, almost uh, in a Buddhist uh, sense, a Buddhist philosophy of this notion of life is suffering, and that uh, it is uh, an unavoidable aspect of life. And if I may just briefly quote the brilliant poet, one of my favorites, Allen Ginsberg, well, while I'm here, I'll do the work. And what is the work? To ease the pain of living. Everything else is drunken dumb show. And I find that to be very powerful. And I think that easing the pain of living is something that we're all interested in. And so I'd like to, having said that, uh, kind of open it up on stage uh, to the idea of uh, how the arts be it poetry, theater, painting, what have you, uh, helps to ease the pain of living and how this kind of the mysticism of, of art can help us kind of all on our existential quest in life. <laughs> <laughs>
knowing. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, in, the, in the Buddhist sense, that is sort of what suffering means. Just the, the, the idea of um, not, not contentment, uh, discontentment. Not, not suffering in the sense of, oh, I'm suffering, but in the sense of life is not perfect. Right. I mean, life is full of contradiction. I, I think true joy is full of, you know, I think everything, as an artist, I think everything contains its opposite. Um, I mean, my work, my plays are comedies. Um, but I think what, I mean, I was really interested in what you were saying. Essentially, I think about craft, you know. There's, there's, there's inspiration, and there's creativity, and then there's the long work of making a piece of art. And a powerful work of art elicits feelings. Art is not made of feelings, actually. Uh, you know, in the theater, we make a scaffolding that an, an audience, I mean, theater, theater only happens in the imaginative intersection between what happens on a stage and with an audience. There is no other thing. There's no book or painting or thing that you can take home with you. That's all that it is. And what the audience feels is not what we're doing on stage. It's not what it's made out of. So there's also a kind of workmanlike aspect to what we do. Um, there, there's an initial, I mean, we have to take leaps of imagination, um, of creativity, but then there's this workmanlike long process of creating this thing that a viewer, an audience, a reader, a recipient uh, intersects with. And you feel a lot of different things. Uh, while you're making it. And one of them, of course, is pleasure. Um, I don't know what's there. Anybody else have a thought on that? Any I, I had another question if we were moving forward. Sure, we'll come back. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so, so much of our conversation has been about the context of creativity within academia or within <coughs> people who can have impacts on larger capitalist markets, which is a very like, small contingent of people in our country and even less so in the world. So how do you think that conversation about creativity is expanded when we actually try to include more, more people, the majority of people, people who don't have higher education, people who don't have enough, who, who barely have enough money to make their, pay their bills and, can, and aren't going, who aren't exploring other things? Like, how can we, how does this conversation about creativity expand when we take it to a more basic level of I'm trying to get through my day to day life? <coughs> That's a good question. You mean in terms of, uh, okay, that's a good question. Let me not, let me not, let me just open it up. I don't, I don't want, go ahead. You have thoughts? On we People are creative. Yeah. Culture is moved from, I mean, look at the revolution in music that's come from that world. People are always creative. I, I meet a lot of people as I travel around the state, a lot of young people. And I'll ask them about themselves and what they like to do, what they're good at, and to let their guard down a little, and what do they really want to do? What, what kind of thing do, do they do? And I hear a lot of interesting things, and I try to help those people have, get the courage, the self-courage to do it. And how can I help? I can talk to them. I can introduce them to people that won't reject them. And so I, I've met some young people that, that are now doing some pretty interesting things in their life. And it's not about, it's not about um, money or it's, it's not about a lot of things. It's about them doing something that they're, that they're interested in doing and maybe were afraid to ask and didn't know how to start doing that. And they took the risk to ask me. And in a few cases, I've helped them. I think it's a good point because I, I think that one of the big challenges, one of the big problems in our society, actually in the world and, and our society is that, in fact, um, you're right, creativity is not limited to any age group or socioeconomic group or, or anything like that. In fact, one of the big problems I think our country is facing today and why we have so many problems is that we haven't created enough spaces for people to be creative throughout the strata of our society. So we're leaving thousands if not millions of people behind who have the ability, um, the creativity, the foresight, etc., cetera, um, to help life be um, more enjoyable for all of us, perhaps to solve problems, uh, and that we limit it, um, you know, just to, to a, limit it too much. You know, success is only understandable in retrospect. 
Right? We never know ahead of time what's going to be successful. Somebody, uh, if any of you have read this, the biography of Steve Jobs, um, when Steve Jobs was first going around, if he had walked in here today with his idea, um, he, t he would probably come in here literally without shoes, smelling because he didn't believe in taking baths, uh, and probably would be one of the you know, last people that we would say, oh yeah, I want to have this person in my company, or I want to listen to them about creative, creative processes or whatever. And, and the fact is that there is no identification of creative people. So I do think that one of the, th the things we do is we have to figure out ways of making the sandbox bigger, involving people like that, giving them opportunities. And, in, and the most important thing is we have to be listening to them. We can't be rejecting them or pushing them off and say, you don't fit our, you know, our stereotypes, so therefore you don't get to play. Yes, sir. Um, the, we had talked a little bit about um, everything containing its opposite. Every, uh, you mentioned things like learning the piano. Um, and you hear about you know, mathematicians who work on a problem, work on a problem, and they don't get anywhere until they just go play the piano for a little while. Um, do you, as, as individual artists and innovators, um, find that that kind of attacking the same problem from different areas, that sort of more holistic, aspect uh, is helpful, and uh, is it necessary, is it something that works for you, and how do you then discern um, between that kind of holistically attacking a problem and just losing focus and messing about in several different disciplines? I, it, for me, um, field trips are kind of an important part of my work, and I've, <laughs> and I've sort of built in that process of, of constantly you know, going to play the piano into the work um, by making sure that I'm constantly intersecting with other disciplines um, through these so-called field trips. So you can build it into your process in some ways. I, I think the more experiences you have, and then if you just sort of let <coughs> trying to solve a problem ferment, sometimes those experiences will, will come at you in a funny way. I keep telling Chris I want to teach an IF University course on what my cows taught me about corporate turnaround. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think that's a really good question. I think, I think one of the most important things that, that art does is force us to see the world from a different lens and a different perspective. I think seeing the world in, through different lenses is, is the key to disruptive, the disruptive process and the key to solving to solving problems because we tend to see things in very, very linear ways. Uh, and we've seen through a lot of research that when you encourage people to look at metaphors and to look at problems in, from very, very different circumstances, uh, it, it, it does facilitate um, getting a clearer perspective and perhaps seeing something in a new, fresh way um, that they couldn't have seen otherwise. So I do think that um, you know, actually doing that and building that into our processes, if I can use that word, is, uh, is critical. And I think it's something that we as humans, uh, as people, have to build into our perspective. I always tell people all the time, read everything you can get your hands on. I don't care whether you're interested in it or not. Read it, pick it up, look at it, experience things. You may have decided you want to spend uh, the next four days reading that same thing, but it gives you something, it gives you a perspective, it tells you how somebody else is looking at the world or enjoying the world, that at some point is, you know, can be beneficial to you. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm a theater education student, and I've been constantly asked the question, with our current education system, is creativity being taken out or ignored? And I've actually come to the conclusion that uh, at face value, yes, but there is still creativity underneath the, underneath the layers. And I was just wondering, how can we, as theater artists, continue to cr nurture creativity in that under layer without bringing it to the front layer, so that people don't get upset, because there are these opinions that the arts are useless. So how can we continue to nurture that creativity, not only in our school systems, but in our community values, outside of our theater spaces? I'm going to figure out, of course, I, to some degree I would argue they, they, it's good for them to be upset. Uh, and I know that has to be done in an appropriate way, um, but it is that discomfort, um, that disruption that, you know, in many cases, you know, it is, is the path to, to something new. Can anybody else have a comment on that, please, or? Well, only in that, I, I mean, I was sort of, well, this conundrum that you're describing, I was sort of uh, wondering this when, uh, when Chris, you were talking about, uh, you know, the importance of teaching creativity. I, I do think that there's a segment, I think it's probably in human nature, but certainly it's uh, very clear 
in our culture right now, which is not in favor of creativity, which, which is not in favor of, you know, which is devoted to a kind of a blind certainty. So there's another question. I mean, we all in this room could believe that teaching creativity is a good idea, but what does that mean when school districts are, they would openly disagree, not even in a subconscious way. They would say that actually is not a good idea. But do they teach you in school a specific skill, or do they teach you how to learn? And so I would look at this as just the start. Um, yes, ma'am, in the very back. The list isn't big enough to I mean, I'd, be, I'd be here, uh, I'd be here all day if all the stuff I wish I had paid attention to when I was younger in school. I don't know. I mean, there's so many things. <laughs> I I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, and so I kept searching and did a number of different things. And I would encourage anybody to uh, you know never lock in on one thing, and and you know. Don't worry too much about what you want to be when you grow up. <laughs> yes, sir, back. Yeah. No, uh, no, no, right in the end. Uh, in the end row. Hi. No, the end row. I'm sorry. Right next to it. You've been at it for a long time. Yeah. Right, yeah. So, um, <laughs> it, it's really easy to to throw around, around a lot of big words as an educated crowd that we are here. That's the sense that I'm get, getting. But how do we deal with the fact that having a conversation like this is in and of itself a huge privilege? The ability to sit around for an hour and talk about creativity is a huge privilege. How do you, how do you all deal with it? How do we all deal with that? Uh, I'm not sure I should understand the question. When you say how do we deal with that, what do you mean that I mean, it is? What, like, I just feel like there's not a really well-balanced or diverse crowd here in terms of, I mean, not, not Ideologically, <laughs> I don't want to characterize everyone's perspective, but it doesn't seem like there's someone representing a really super practical, uh, maybe conservative, maybe as this gentleman here mentioned, just trying to get through the day and survive to feed one's family perspective here. I mean, it just, it strikes me that this conversation is very, very uh, lofty. Well, one thing I'm doing for Chris is going around the state with a program on teaching people or talking about what design centered manufacturing is. We're, we're going to anybody that will listen. Um, last week we were up in um, Florence at Gateway Community and Technical College, and a lot of the students that were there were, I think, the class of people that, that you're talking about. We'll, we'll do anything, you know, if you have any ideas of, of conversations like this we can have with other groups of people, let us know. I think, well, first of all, I think that everybody has to decide for themselves. I mean, creativity, it's like, it's like enjoying reading. You know, there's some people who read all day long and some people who have time to do nothing more than read a couple of pages every day. Uh, and I think, I think the, the, what we have to try to do is, first of all, is encourage people that these things are important uh, for lots of reasons, you know, in terms of just personal enrichment and enjoyment. And so I think no matter, I mean, certainly there are people whose lives are such that from the minute they get up in the morning to the minute they go to bed, you know, they have to worry about putting food on the table or, um, you know, perhaps they're, they're suffering some kind of chronic illness or, or whatever. Um, but I have found that, you know, everybody, you know, the, it, that, that can fit into our lives in, in, in many, many different ways. Um, I'm always struck by, it really bothers me, the number of CEOs I run into who tell me they don't have time to read fiction. Um, I would never buy stock in a company uh, whose CEO said they didn't have time to read fiction because that tells me that they don't have a very broad perspective of what they're going to learn. So that's, that's why I would, would, would think about that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I'd say no because you don't know what you don't know what's a good idea until it's all over. I mean, I mean, and sometimes then you don't even know what it is. I mean, it's good ideas are only good in retrospect. I mean, 
and they really are. They all did that in retrospect. But you know, I, I, there's so many. I'm sure the, the artists and scientists. I mean, in fact, um, you know, Einstein said, you know, if if your idea at first isn't crazy, uh, there's no hope for it. <laughs> The, the hardest part about collaboration is when everybody that you're collaborating with tells you what an idiot you are. So, but once you get over that, that you know, you, you know, that people attack you, you know, just just get over it and keep moving forward. Um, a couple years ago, we had the festival. We had two speakers at the same festival. One was Ray Bradbury, a great science fiction writer, and two we had John C. Wozniak. Um, and both of them actually spoke different times. They both said the same thing in part of their lives. They said, don't ever listen to what, don't listen to what people have to tell you about your work. Um, and what they meant by that is not that you can't learn from it and they can't contribute, but don't let them rain on your parade. If you really feel passionate about what you're doing, you have to, you have to proceed. We have time for one more question. Yes, ma'am.